th I want to welcome the staff, students, to this annual 46th TB Davy Memorial Lecture. The lecture, as many of you know, and many of you have attended this uh, for many years, is that one of the highlights of the UCT calendar, the academic calendar. It's named after one of our former Vice Chancellors, Thomas Benjamin Davy, who led the university during the crucial development years post-World War II from 1948 until his death in 1955. And he is remembered as a fearless defender of the principles of academic freedom and university autonomy, defining academic freedom as the university's right to determine who shall be taught, who shall teach, what shall be taught, and how it shall be taught. UCT has had the honor of hosting many uh, huge, larger-than-life defenders of freedom, of university autonomy, of freedom of speech, to give this annual lecture. And the legacy and spotlight on academic freedom and human freedom continues today through the invitation of another distinguished speaker, Professor Nadine Strossen. It is a reaffirmation of UCT's policy that its members will enjoy the freedom to explore ideas, express them, and assemble peacefully. It is also, uh, the, the Academic Freedom Committee has itself had this debate, and it's a debate that is particularly important this year about whether if there is a need to continue with an academic freedom lecture annually post-1994, given that most, much of the uh, oppression, much of the restriction of freedom of speech that triggered the establishment of the lectures uh, had passed, initially the 1959 Extension of Universities Act and subsequent uh, legislation, security legislation that resulted in the detention of students, of staff, and restrictions on speech. But perhaps the events in the last year have emphasized uh, more than any other why it's important to maintain this tradition and to maintain this lecture with the threats of the Freedom of Information or the, uh, Act or Bill, the threats of establishing a media tribunal, and the attacks we've seen on many public platforms uh, of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, it is uh, more important than ever that we maintain our voice, that we maintain this tradition that we, and through it, our voice of protest and defense of academic freedom. Thank to everyone who contributed to this event, especially Andrew Nash, who has been unstintingly helpful to me throughout the very long planning process. Uh, I have very much enjoyed my all too brief visit to your beautiful campus. I have met many wonderful, interesting staff members and students who are also very impressive. Uh, and as you can see, I'm so enthusiastic about UCT that I've actually dressed in your school color today. <laughs> uh, I'm so honored to deliver this lecture, which is dedicated to such important values and to be following in the footsteps of so many impressive predecessors. But before I say anything more about my very serious assigned topic, I'm going to follow the convention, at least in my country, of beginning even the most serious talk with uh, some humor. So I have to tell you, having done very extensive research, jokes about academic freedom are rare. <laughs> and uh, funny jokes about academic freedom are very rare. <laughs> So with that disclaimer, let me briefly share two short samples with you. Each one is semi-amusing, so maybe they add up to one good laugh. So uh, there's one joke I found about assistant professors for whom academic freedom means being free to choose any 100 hours per week to work. <laughs> and as for full professors, um, the joke goes, how many full professors does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the answer is just one. The professor holds the bulb up to the socket and waits for the world to revolve around him or her. <laughs> now for the serious part, also fun. Uh, in preparing for this lecture, I avidly researched and read all available information about Dr. Davey, about the lecture series, and the history of academic freedom on your campus. 
I learned a lot of impressive facts about Dr. Davy, including that he only began his illustrious academic career in medical science, along with the current distinguished vice chancellor, same field. Uh, Dr. Davy began his medical studies in 1933 when he was already 38 years old. He began his medical studies unusually late, only after he had worked as a school teacher to save enough money in order to pursue his abiding passion for medicine. So Dr. Davy personally empathized with other people who had to overcome various obstacles to pursue their educational goals. No wonder with that background and personal experience that he so powerfully championed academic freedom and opportunity for all at a crucial time when those values were especially under siege on your campus and in your country due to apartheid. And also, I hasten to add, in my country, which had its own apartheid policies on too many campuses, and where professors were also being persecuted for their ideas and their associations as part of the Cold War anti-communist witch hunt. A biographical book chapter I read about Dr. Davy captured his courageous commitment in an episode shortly before he died of the painful rheumatoid arthritis from which he had long been suffering. I'd like to quote from this chapter, uh, which was written by Leo Marquardt, who I see is the namesake of one of your residences here at UCT. Uh, Marquardt wrote, a few days before his death in 1955, Dr. Davy was talking to Dr. De Kiwit, himself also a distinguished South African academic, about the university situation in South Africa. Crippled with pain as he was, Dr. Davy told Dr. Kiwit, quote, as long as I can get to my feet, I shall fight. Indeed, based on Dr. Davy's outspoken championship of liberty and equality, I would love to claim him as a posthumous honorary member of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Consider, for example, an important 1955 lecture he delivered, uh, which has been published in book form and is now available worldwide to this day, as evidenced by the fact that I obtained it in New York City. Back in 1955, when he gave this lecture, public schools in many parts of the United States including my nation's capital, were still racially segregated by law. In contrast, in Dr. Davies' 1955 lecture, he strongly championed fully integrated education regardless of race or ethnicity. Uh, that would not have been a popular position even in the United States at that time. More broadly, he declared that the government is responsible for all its people to ensure the rights and liberties of each of its individuals. And that is exactly the core credo of the ACLU. Now, as someone who has been both an academic and an activist, as Andrew explained, I feel a close bond to T.B. Davy and the broad concept of academic freedom which he and his university, your university, have been dedicated to. The 2004 Davy Lecture by Professor Jonathan Janssen hailed Dr. Davy's character as a scholar and his credentials as an activist. Yet, in his 2002 Davy Lecture, then Minister of Education, the late Kader Asmal, added to that praise a further challenge for all of us. As he said, we salute T.B. Davy and the others of his generation who with great courage and conviction sought to prevent apartheid being extended to academies of learning. Their failure arose from their isolation from the main forces of resistance to apartheid. Accordingly, Minister Asmal urged us to more closely link academic freedom to other rights and freedoms in the broader public domain. The University of Cape Town has endorsed this robust concept, this broad concept of academic freedom. 
I'd like to quote, uh, for those of you who have not committed it to memory, the pertinent language from your university's policy on academic freedom. Um, it says, this university recognizes our duty to defend and seek to extend academic freedom, and in particular, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly in society generally. In Andrew Nash's cordial email that invited me to deliver this lecture, he encouraged me to discuss this topic within this broadly conceived concept of academic freedom. So accordingly, I have decided to focus on the single most important overarching challenge to human rights that has been facing the United States in the past decade and which will continue to haunt all of us moving forward, including specifically all of us in the academic community, namely the government's expansion of power and constriction of individual rights in the name of the so-called war on terror. Now, as I have discussed with Andrew, my focus will be the United States because that is where my experience and expertise lies. And Andrew has assured me that my government's policies are of interest and influence here, for better or worse. Uh, that point was unforgettably etched in my memory by one of your great countrymen, Arthur Chaskelson, who spoke at the ACLU's 2008 membership conference in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was also so gracious as to participate in the luncheon in my honor at that conference, which took place near the end of my ACLU presidency. And I was so honored that Justice Chaskelson joined three United States Supreme Court justices at that event. At the ACLU conference, Justice Chaskelson talked so movingly about the years during apartheid when he said he and others who struggled for human rights here were inspired not only by the ACLU, but also by the pro-human rights government policies that we and our allies were able to secure. In contrast, he spoke with great sadness about how dispiriting it has been for him and South African colleagues to see the US forfeit its moral authority and leadership on the human rights front in the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Indeed, Amnesty International and other international human rights groups have deplored the post 9-11 cutbacks on rights in my country, not only for their own sake, but also because of the adverse ripple effect they have caused around the world, emboldening many other governments to follow suit. Throughout the ACLU's long history, and uh, we are indeed now 92 years old, uh, almost the same age as Nelson Mandela of wis achieving wisdom, uh, we have always been staunchly nonpartisan throughout that history, never supporting or opposing any political party official or candidate. And one of the reasons is that support for and violations of civil liberties cross all party and ideological lines. That general pattern is certainly true in the specific context I'm addressing. So last year, the ACLU issued a report that explained how the Obama administration has perpetuated too many Bush administration anti-terror policies that had been considered extreme and unlawful when they were implemented. And therefore, the Obama administration has transformed these policies into, as our report was entitled, a new normal. This dangerous tendency to normalize extreme measures that are allegedly justified only by a short-term emergency, that tendency was recognized by none other than Dr. T.B. Davey himself specifically in the context of academic freedom. In Dr. Davies' 1948 inaugural address, upon being installed as UCT's principal and vice chancellor, uh, which Andrew has already quoted, uh, among other things, Dr. Davey noted that recent history has shown how easily and almost imperceptibly universities can be deprived of their freedom. In words that are chillingly apt today, more than six decades later, he warned, controls and restrictions 
that are imposed and accepted under conditions of war are only too meekly submitted to even when the conditions necessitating their imposition have disappeared. Consistent with the TB Davy lecture theme, I am going to focus specifically on the new normal post 9-11 policies that endanger academic and intellectual freedom. I want to alert all of my academic colleagues here to the enormous inroads that are not nearly as well known as they should be, even in the United States itself. Most importantly, I hope to inspire you to maintain active vigilance against any parallel developments in your country. And again, I want to stress the theme I noted from the late Minister Osmal's Davy lecture and from UCT's academic freedom policy that all of us in the academic community have a special responsibility to champion freedom in society more broadly and to collaborate with others including human rights activists in doing so. Now, Andrew helpfully sent me an essay by a South African professor who criticized the academic community here for not fulfilling this role specifically concerning the issue I'm addressing, government policies in the name of national security that unjustifiably undermine academic freedom and associated freedom in society at large. This essay was written by Professor Jane Duncan, who teaches at Rhodes University. She describes the Protection of Information Bill, which both speakers have already alluded to, uh, which the ANC proposed, and which she called the single biggest threat to academic freedom in South Africa since 1994. Now, I understand that amendments have been made to the bill, uh, but even from the press I've read during the last couple of days while I've been in South Africa, I understand it continues to be strongly criticized uh, as too repressive. Professor Duncan's critique uh, of the bill rings all too familiar in terms of U.S. government policy, vesting undue power in the executive branch of government to enforce an overbroad concept of national security and state secrets that stifles the acquisition and dissemination of vital information and ideas. Even more disturbing than the government suppression that Professor Duncan describes is her conclusion that some universities here aren't resisting it with sufficient vigor, in other words, failing to follow sufficiently actively in the footsteps of Dr. T.B. Davy. Now, I have no expertise about the situation here. I don't know whether Professor Duncan's assessment is fair, but it at least serves as a rallying cry for any member of the academic community here who has not uh, actively defended academic freedom, and it also serves as a thank you to those of you who have done so. She wrote, the bottom line is that the Protection of Information Bill will make the government the arbiter of what can and cannot be researched. It can block research that may reveal inconvenient truths. Progressive, socially engaged scholars will be the biggest losers, and these are the very scholars who are in short supply in an increasingly timid and inwardly focusing South Africa academy. While the media and civil society have mobilized admirably against the bill, universities have been largely missing in action. Well, consistent with the exhortation in Professor Duncan's piece, in my account of the parallel situation in the US, the government's invoking of national security concerns to stifle academic and related freedoms, I'm going to cite examples of the ACLU's work in collaboration with members of the academic community in the US and beyond. Indeed, one of our major post 9-11 clients in an important and ultimately successful campaign after a long series of efforts, uh, one of these clients is a prominent professor from right here in South Africa, namely Adam Habib, Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Johannesburg. So let me start with that case and the general issue it exemplifies, which we call ideological exclusion, namely the US government enforcing immigration laws to exclude individuals not on the basis of some actual threat that they pose to national security, but rather just because they have expressed ideas that the government dislikes 
in particular criticism of U.S. policy. The government's asserted authority for this practice derives from a provision in the polemically named USA Patriot Act, a massive law that was rushed through Congress right after the 9-11 attacks with almost no hearings, no debates, and uh, no nay votes. Uh, almost none. One of the many under-publicized rights-reducing provisions that laced this dangerous law gives the Secretary of State power to bar any non-citizen from the U.S. if the Secretary determines that that person's advocacy undermines U.S. anti-terrorism efforts. Indeed, the U.S. State Department has authorized our consular officials around the world to bar from the U.S. anyone who has engaged in, and I quote, irresponsible expression of opinion irresponsible expression of opinion. I, I'm so relieved that this provision doesn't apply to U.S. citizens. Uh, I say that uh, because George W. Bush's first Attorney General, John Ashcroft, expressly accused me and other civil libertarian critics of post-9-11 abuses of exactly such irresponsibility. He actually told a congressional committee that our criticism was akin to treason. That comment prompted an amusing headline in my favorite satirical publication, The Onion, uh, as it proclaimed, Bush asks Congress for $30 billion to help fight war on criticism. <laughs> well, in the real, non-satiric world, Congress did give the Bush administration a major resource to fight against criticism through this sweeping ideological exclusion provision in the Patriot Act. Since 2001, the U.S. government has invoked this provision to exclude dozens of foreign academics in many different fields from all over the world. And sadly, these policies remind me of the banning orders under apartheid in your country, including bans on members of the UCT community. As I read about on your website's timeline about UCT's struggle for an open university, uh, as for the U.S.'s current analog to banning orders, ideological exclusion, the ACLU has spearheaded opposition through lawsuits, through negotiations with the State Department and public pressure, and I'd like to illustrate that work through the case of South Africa's own Adam Habib, who of course is a world-renowned scholar, researcher, and political commentator of particular concern uh, and pertinence to his exclusion from the U.S., he has been an outspoken critic of U.S. post-9-11 policies. In 2006, Dr. Habib arrived at Kennedy Airport in New York City to attend a series of meetings that had been scheduled with scholars and universities. U.S. officials detained him at the airport and interrogated him for seven hours about his political views and associations. As Dr. Habib commented, the first time something like this happened to me was in South Africa during apartheid in the struggle days. Again, reminding me of Arthur Chaskelson's uh, disturbing comparison. Following that extended interrogation, armed guards marched Dr. Habib back to the airplane and deported him to South Africa without any explanation whatsoever. Dr. Habib applied for another U.S. visa in 2007 in response to speaking invitations from several U.S. academic groups, including the American Sociological Association, but the U.S. government did not issue the visa, and again, it didn't even deign to give any reasons for its continued exclusion of Dr. Habib, essentially treating him as a non-person. Uh, in response, then, the ACLU filed a lawsuit on behalf of the American Sociological Association, one of the organizations that had invited Dr. Habib to speak, and also on behalf of the American Association of University Professors. We argued that the ideological exclusion policy that the government was enforcing, not only in this case, but also in many others, violates the rights of everyone in the United States, our rights to access ideas and information through face-to-face -face discussion and dialogue with visitors from outside the country. 
At least our lawsuit immediately prompted the government for the very first time to give an explanation for its refusal to admit Dr. Habib, but the government's so-called explanation was just a conclusory allegation that he had, quote, engaged in terrorist activities. The court ultimately ruled in our favor, holding that the U.S. Constitution's free speech guarantee bars the government from excluding a scholar who has been invited to address U.S. audiences unless it has a valid, substantiated reason for the exclusion. Now, important as that legal ruling was, it didn't end the litigation because the U.S. government contended that it could substantiate its claims that Dr. Habib had engaged in terrorism. So the lawsuit was still ongoing when Barack Obama became president and uh, Dr. Habib was still ideologically excluded at that point. And the Obama administration continued to resist both that lawsuit and another one that the ACLU had brought on behalf of another world-renowned scholar who also had been ideologically excluded from the US, Tariq Ramadan an expert on Islam who had been teaching at Oxford and who had accepted a tenured professorship at a major U.S. university, Notre Dame. After the ACLU won several favorable rulings in both of these lawsuits, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton finally ended the exclusions of professors Habib and Ramadan last year, just last year. Even then, though, the Obama administration continued to ideologically exclude other prominent scholars and writers. So therefore, the ACLU and our academic coalition partners persisted with our advocacy efforts, which finally bore positive fruit at the very end of last year. We received a letter from Harold Coe, who is now the State Department's legal advisor. Not coincidentally, Harold Coe, before his current position, was a distinguished academic a law professor at Yale University and also dean of the Yale Law School. Coe's letter expressly renounced the practice of ideological exclusion and gave special support to academic and intellectual freedom. He pledged that in making decisions about admitting non-citizens in the U.S., State Department officials, quote, will give significant and sympathetic weight to the fact that the primary purpose of the travel will be to assume a university teaching post, to fulfill speaking engagements, to attend academic conferences, or for similar expressive or educational activities. So that was a major victory for intellectual freedom, and we're indebted in America to South Africa's Adam Habib for helping us to bring about this increased freedom for everyone in our country as well. Unfortunately, though, the Obama administration has pursued too many other policies that are claimed to be essential to the war on terror, but that actually function instead as a war on academic and intellectual freedom. In my limited remaining time, uh, I'm going to note three major examples. Excessive government secrecy, unwarranted government surveillance, and an overbroad concept of material support for terrorism. The first two of these problematic policies, secrecy and surveillance, are two sides of the same coin. An essential foundation for intellectual freedom is full and free access to information unimpeded by the government. And in a democratic society, no information is more important than information about our government and the policies that it's carrying out in the name of we the people, to quote the opening phrases of both our constitutions in South Africa and the United States. Conversely, for all of us academic folks to freely and fully engage in intellectual and educational pursuits, an essential precondition is protection from intrusive government surveillance. If we fear that the government is spying on our research and communications, that will deter us from these pursuits. Likewise, if individuals who would otherwise be sources of information and insight for us fear that the government is spying on their communications with us, that could well deter them from engaging in such communications. And all of this adversely impacts not only those of us who are engaged in scholarly activities, but everyone who might seek access to our work as well. 
Unfortunately, since 9-11, both the Bush and Obama administrations have reversed the appropriate relationship between individuals and the government in terms of information flow. On the one hand, it has been much too hard for individuals to obtain information about government action and government policies. On the other hand, it has been too easy for the government to obtain information about individuals' ideas. Uh, let me spell out these problems just a bit more, starting with secrecy. Uh, as has been said by uh, both preceding speakers, you are facing some parallel issues right here in South Africa in light of the pending Protection of Information Bill. Uh, also in the same vein, I, I read a piece in this morning's Cape Times by Carmel Rickard uh, that noted government resistance to complying with your protection, promotion of access to Information Act, which is another parallel to the U.S. situation. Uh, exactly one week ago today, coincidentally, the ACLU issued a comprehensive report that scathingly indicts the excessive government secrecy in the U.S. that has increased exponentially since 2001. The report documents in detail the many harms of such undue secrecy, including harm to national security itself. Uh, in fact, this critique ties into the academic freedom concern. The report quotes the co-chair of the Blue Ribbon uh, Commission on the causes of the 9-11 attacks in the U.S., who noted that the unwarranted withholding of government information undermines national security by precluding constructive input into policymaking from various key societal sectors, including academia. Uh, the report advocates many specific radical reforms. It's a serious problem. It calls for radical reforms uh, to what it describes as the cancer of secrecy that is eating away at our democratic body politic. Uh, the title of this ACLU report, I know you can't see it, but you'll find it on our website, www.aclu.org, uh, and the title says it all. Drastic measures required. Congress needs to overhaul U.S. secrecy laws and increase oversight of the secret security establishment. Because South Africa is considering its own new measure on point, I urge you to take into account the substantial specific evidence in the ACLU report, which demonstrates the many harms of undue government secrecy. And I don't have much time, so now I'm just going to tick off the categories, each of which is supported by substantial uh, evidence in our report of these harms. One, secrecy undermines democracy. Two, secrecy undermines constitutional checks and balances. Three, secrecy undermines security. Four, secrecy lets the executive branch mislead and manipulate Congress and the people, often to achieve political rather than security objectives. Five, secrecy enables and encourages incompetence, waste, fraud, and abuse. And six, secrecy puts the government behind the times in terms of open information. One point I want to stress is that our report from start to finish cites countless experts from the military, intelligence, and law enforcement communities based on their experience demonstrating that more harm than good is caused by excessive secrecy, including to national security itself. When we turn from secrecy to surveillance, uh, we also see an enormous chilling impact on speech and academic freedom. I'd just like to cite a couple examples. Um, early in his campaign for president, candidate Obama decried President Bush's suspicious, warrantless surveillance of Americans' international telephone and email communications. However, Senator Obama later supported a statute that actually expanded this unprecedented surveillance power. Likewise, President Obama pushed Congress to expand the most problematic surveillance provisions of the Patriot Act, including the so-called library provision, which allows the government to secretly obtain records 
of the books you borrow and the web searches you make merely by asserting that this information is relevant to an investigation without any suspicion that you are engaging in any illegal conduct, without any notice to you, and without any judicial review. I'd like to cite just a couple examples of the lawsuits that the ACLU has brought against some of these sweeping new surveillance powers that most directly affect academic freedom. Uh, one of our clients in this litigation is New York University professor Barnett Rubin, who is a renowned scholar on conflict prevention specializing in Afghanistan. His research entails countless phone and email communications with people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other foreign countries. I'd like to read you one excerpt from an affidavit that Professor Rubin filed in our lawsuit. He said, I'm currently researching the political position of the insurgency in Afghanistan. I regard such research as potentially contributing to the effort to bring peace and stability to Afghanistan. My ability to carry out such research will be seriously hindered because of the perception held both by me and by Afghan insurgents and their supporters that our electronic communications are monitored by the U.S. government. Therefore, I will have to conduct in-person interviews and will be unable to conduct follow-up by email and telephone. I will have to travel more internationally to complete the research or I will complete fewer research interviews or less comprehensive interviews. Uh, I had another example I was going to cite of the adverse impact on students who are conducting field research around the world who will be unable to maintain email contact and phone contact with their supervising professor back home, but I'm aware of the clock and I know students and faculty members have to go to their classes. So uh, let me proceed quickly to the third example I was going to give. Uh, of post 9-11 attacks on academic freedom that have been supported by both the Bush and Obama administrations as well as Congress and the United States Supreme Court. And this is a distorted, exaggerated concept of material support uh, for terrorism that in fact criminalizes much speaking, writing, and teaching. This overbroad concept reflects the very same fundamental flaw of the ideological exclusion policy that barred Adam Habib and other scholars from the US, namely the notion that ideas or expression can constitute punishable terrorism. Uh, this is yet another assault that flows back to the Patriot Act, which expanded the already overbroad definition of material support to terrorism to include expert advice and assistance. And I should also note here in South Africa that the Secretary of State has enormous discretion to designate organizations as FTOs or foreign terrorist organizations and that label applied to none other than the African National Congress until shockingly recently. It, that designation was removed only in 2008. Uh, so you add this overbroad concept of a foreign terrorist organization to an overbroad concept of material support, and you get an absolutely sweeping government power uh, to suppress uh, even academic undertakings. And I'll just quickly note that the ACLU, in our challenge to uh, this particular application of the law, represented at three academically based institutions. Uh, at George Mason University, Notre Dame University, and the Carter Center for Human Rights at Emory University, founded by former US President Jimmy Carter, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2002. These university-based centers are studying and teaching peace building skills, but the Patriot Act's broad language turns even these constructive academic ent undertakings into terrorist crimes. Worse yet, the Supreme Court last year specifically upheld the act's applications to these academic activities. Uh, the powerful dissenting opinion, it was a five to four decision, but uh, small comfort, especially when you read how powerful the dissent was. Uh, interestingly enough, written by a Supreme Court justice who had been a law professor before uh, ascending to the high court. And as he pointed out, the majority had upheld 
of the government's power to criminalize even the peaceful teaching of international human rights law. Now I'm going to conclude, respectful of the time, there's far more I could say, I assure you, but I think you've gotten uh, enough information about how severe the dangers are. I hope you will fight against the parallels here. In concluding my lecture that is named after a distinguished South African professor, I'd like to quote another distinguished South African professor who ties together the themes I have addressed. I'm referring again to Dr. Adam Habib, who has been both a victim of some of the repressive policies I've discussed, but more importantly, a victor in successfully challenging those policies, working with both academic and human rights groups for the benefit of not only academics, but also society more generally, not only in my country, but also in yours and worldwide. Back in 2007, while he was still being ideologically excluded from the U.S., Adam Habib wrote an essay explaining why he was fighting to overturn this U.S. policy. And I'd like to quote an excerpt from this powerful statement, which harkens back to Dr. T.B. Davey with its reference to apartheid, and which also points toward the future, to the ongoing efforts we should all make. So here are Dr. Habib's pertinent words. If our governments get in the habit of excluding academics from other countries for ideological reasons, then we are on a slippery slope to the abrogation of all freedoms. Having lived in apartheid South Africa, I know what this means. This case was filed on my behalf, a South African, by the ACLU and other US organizations. The lawyers are American, the plaintiffs are Americans. The cause is the right of these Americans to hear and speak with a South African. We are not all of one ideological persuasion. Many of those who have stood up on my behalf, I don't even know. What unites us is that we stand for principle, and this is the fight for the future. The coming struggles for freedom will be played on the global plane and require us to build bridges across national, religious, and ideological boundaries. Assisting in the struggle is what we can bequeath to our children. They can say, we were on the right side of their struggle for freedom. So I'm going to end where I started by thanking all of you for being part of these positive efforts through the TV Davy lecture series and through your other ongoing contributions to academic freedom at UCT and beyond. Thank you very much.